welcome to the, uh, what do we call ourselves? There ain't nobody here. <laughs> of course, when you leave here, there will be nobody. If you want to be somebody, you can't be wrong side. We are a bunch of nobodies. How many of you are here for the first time? Please do not be this nice that you are. I am not a lecturer. I am not a philosopher. I am not a sermonizer. Is there such a way you sermonize? Mm -hmm. I heard of womanizer. <laughs> I'm not a sermonizer. <laughs> <laughs> We're one big happy family here. Some families aren't too happy. So one big family. Or one big. I want to thank most of you for sharing your Christmas and uh, Hanukkah gifts with me. It's very unusual being in Los Angeles. In the past, I never used to take anything that was given to me. But since I got to Los Angeles, things have changed. <laughs> anyway, thanks. I received a phone call this morning from somebody. He wasn't here now. And they asked me to elaborate on the question that Glenn asked last week. Corners in the corner. His question was Does a realized person, a sage, a yani, become angry? And I briefly touched on that. I was more succinct, didn't say too much about it. Somebody wanted me to elaborate on that for some reason. It's an interesting question. Humans get angry. Therefore, when you've reached self-realization, do you still have feelings of anger, of rage, or outrage? A question like this is usually asked by a seeker or a disciple. A devotee couldn't care less. When you ask a question like this, You're asking from the viewpoint of the Ayani. And there are different answers. It's very paradoxical.
It reminds me of the time I was initiated by Paramahansa Yogananda in self-realization when I was 17 prior to going to India to receive Ramana Maharshi. And during the initiation, <clears throat> I was on my knees and he put his hand on my head and he said, Robert, do you promise to love me no matter what I do? Or no matter what you think you see me do? I hesitated. I said to myself, what is he going to do? <laughs> is he going to kill somebody who wants me to love no matter what he does? But then I also realized that I didn't have all the answers. So I said, yes. It's only by being around him two or three months that I realized what he meant. He reacted differently to different people, to different personalities. It was Christmas. And he was living with the monks in Encinitas at that time. So I recall one monk came over to him and said, Master, they call him Master, may I go visit my family at Christmas time? I'll be gone for two weeks. He became very sweet and he said, Of course you can. You should see your family. They miss you. Go and have a good time and come back in two weeks. But then somebody else came and kneeled before him and said, Master, may I go see my family during Christmas? He became outraged and started screaming at the monk and said, How dare you ask me a question like this? Why do you want to see your family? They don't want to see you. Of course you can't go. Don't ask stupid questions. Go back to your quarters. This was the dilemma. Same questions, different answers. I consequently realized that he was able to read into the person. Exactly what was going on with each person. He couldn't possibly give the same answer to, to different people. He realized the first person had a loving family and the first person had high self-esteem. So it wouldn't matter where that person goes. Their heart is always on truth, on reality, on God. But the second person had a low self-esteem. And if he left, he would be dragged by the powers of Maya back into reality of materiality, that is, the reality of materiality. And he probably wouldn't even come back again. That's why I gave that answer. And so it is with the answer that Glenn, the question that Glenn asked. Sometimes a sage puts on an act, fakes it, for the benefit of the devotees or the disciples or the seekers. It's necessary. If you recall the incident with Jesus and the money changes, Jesus, Jesus supposedly got very angry when he went to the temple and saw all of the merchants selling their wares on the steps of the temple. He overturned the table and said, How dare you do this in my father's house? And chased them all away. It appears he also got angry. But did he? 
when you speak of a sage, of a yani, supposedly they are transcendent. They've transcended. They have no ego and no personality left. So what gets angry? It is the ego that gets angry. The mind. If there's no ego mind left, how can you possibly become angry? Therefore, a true sage, a yani, can never really become angry for he doesn't have the mechanism to become angry again. It's been transcended. It's like the story of the Zen monk who came to the master and said, Master, I'm always getting angry. I can't help it. What should I do? So the master took out his sword and cut off his head. And so let's say you get angry now. And as the story goes, he became enlightened. His head flew back on and he was realized. There is no one to become angry. Think about yourself. You have emotions, you become angry. You have all kinds of psychological symptoms. Where do they come from? Why are they there? You have to ask yourself, Why do I become angry? Why do I have these emotions? Why do I allow my mind to think past my nose? I'm responsible for my own life. That's what you should talk to yourself. If I have all these negative emotions, how can I possibly function in the world? I blame others. I see the faults of others. I'm always judging. I'm always criticizing. Am I right? Even though if I appear to be right, I'm wrong. I'm wrong simply because I do not understand the universe. I usually get angry because things are not going my way. The world is not turning the way I want it to. So I criticize, I judge. For I believe things should be this way instead of that way. I believe people should do this instead of that. I believe this person should be this way instead of that way. Why do I believe this? This is the way you should talk to yourself. What is it that's in me that makes me this way? Is it a power? Is it a force? Is it some kind of entity am I possessed? Actually, who am I? Who am I with this great temper, with this anger? And as you keep inquiring, who am I? you will begin to focus on the I. Who am I? 
what is this I? I am always referring to I. I am angry. I am disillusioned. I have a bad temper. Why, if this I weren't here, there would be no one to experience these verities I just mentioned. So what is the source of I? The problem really isn't the temper or the anxiety or the depression. The problem is the I. It is the I who has this problem, not me. Subsequently, the secret is to dissolve the I, to annihilate the I. For I reason out that if the eye is destroyed, there will be no one left to get this problem. So how do I dissolve the eye? Simply by inquiring, where did the eye come from? I wake up, I say I slept. I had a dream, I wake up, I say I dreamt. I am awake, I say now I am awake. I feel depressed, I say I am depressed. There is always I. Reasoning will tell you that all of your troubles are attached to I. The troubles have no validity by themselves. The disappointments, the disillusionments, the anger, the temper, (coughs) they have no validity. It is the I that appears to have validity. So where did the I come from? Who gave it birth? Who feels it? Again, I do. So is I. Who am I? What is the source of the I? By holding on to the I and following it to the source, it will dissolve. It will disappear of its own accord. So you inquire. Whenever you have a problem, you must ask yourself, to whom does it come? It makes no difference how many problems you may have. It makes no difference what is disturbing you, how serious your particular problem may loom in your mind. The method is always the same. To whom does it come? Why it comes to me? Me is the same as I. You hold on to the me, or you hold on to the I. You do not concentrate on the I. You concentrate on the source of the I. But you hold on to the I like you're holding on to a rope. You're climbing down to the end of the rope. And every time you say to yourself, who am I? Or what is this I? 
you're going deeper and deeper within yourself. Deeper and deeper. Into oblivion. Into emptiness. Into the void. As you repeat, who am I? The space between the thoughts, who am I? becomes greater and greater. And you begin to identify with the space between the thoughts of who am I. All of a sudden you find a profound peace overtaking you. A peace which passeth all understanding. This is not a piece that you've known before. It's different. It's a piece that overtakes you completely. And you lose your body awareness. It has nothing to do with the things of the world. It's a blissful peace. You remain in that state. Included in the peace is a feeling of immortality. Without using words, you just know I was never born and I can never die. It's as if you just studied a course at the university for five years. You're so sure of these things. You just know that all is well and everything's unfolding as it should. There is nothing wrong anywhere. You feel wonderful. You have become yourself. You have not changed into anybody. You have become your natural self. That is your true self. This feeling never leaves you. It is always with you. Whether you work or you sleep or you do nothing, this profound peace, this love, this feeling of immortality, never leaves you. The question arises, who is born? Who dies? And the answer comes, no one. There is no cause for existence. Existence is not real. 
You just know this. Whereas before, you were identifying with the material world. The material world was real to you. But now you just know. You have just become infinity itself. You become aware of the fact that this universe does not exist. And something tells you further that the universe exists as if in a dream. That's all. When you're dreaming, you find yourself in the universe. You're flying in a plane, you're cooking, you're eating, you're killing, you're making love, you're doing all kinds of things. It's all happening in your dream. It seems so real. If anyone comes and tells you you're dreaming, you refuse to believe them because the dream appears very, very real. Then you wake up and you're back to the waking state, which is just another dream. In any event, you are aware of all these things instantaneously. And no one can ever tell you again that the world is real. You are unable to explain it for there are no words to describe reality. You just know. You also realize that there is nothing in all this dream world that can possibly harm you or cause you unhappiness. And you look at the world as an optical illusion. It appears to be here but it's not. You consequently stop reacting to person, place, or thing. For if you react, you're identifying with the dream world. You don't actually stop reacting there's something inside of you that no longer allows you to react. You have separated yourself from the relative universe. The question is, why do you want to become like this? Or it sounds to the average person like you become a babbling idiot. You're no longer part of this world. You have to ask yourself, therefore, what is this world all about? This world is a world of constant change. Look at my body. I am not the same person I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. 
I've changed completely. And I'm getting older and the body will die sooner or later. What am I working for? Why do I do all these things I do every day? Why am I so concerned with this life and that life and this person and that person and the world situation? I do not understand anything. And that's the beginning of divine ignorance. You realize that you do not know what anything is. As an example, you look at a tree. You do not know what a tree is. You were born into a situation where a tree was evident for you. It's just there. And people call it a tree. They could have called it a dog or a cat, but they call it a tree. Where does it come from? What came first, the seed or the tree? It's a mystery. You don't know. You look at a spider, a dog, a cat. What are they doing here? Where did they come from? What is their purpose? You have no idea what anything is. And you have no idea what you are. Therefore, you no longer condemn, you no longer hate, you no longer judge, you no longer find fault, and you no longer try to change anybody. You leave the world alone. You leave people alone. You leave everything alone. You keep working on yourself. What are you doing with your life? How did you go through your life today? What kind of thoughts went through your mind? What kind of feelings, emotions did you have? You have to begin somewhere. Instead of identifying with your emotions, your problems begin gradually to change. By asking yourself the question, who am I? Who has these problems? It makes no difference how long it takes. Time and space do not exist. They appear to exist. We have learned that whatever you say, whatever you do to someone else, however you act, returns to you. Why? Because there's only one I. There's one self. There are not two or three selves. There's only one self. 
And therefore, what I give to you, what I take from you, what I do to you, I am doing to myself. If I hate you, I hate myself. The trouble is, we do not see the results immediately. So we think we're getting away with something. You can't get away with anything. Everything always comes back to you. As an example, say you're a pickpocket. And you pick a person's pocket and you find a wallet with $50,000. And you say, great, look what I got. You justify it. You say, that person is rich. They don't need it. I do. You move to Canada and you buy a house. You get a job. Ten years pass. This is the falsity of time and space. There appears to be time, but there's not. It's really happening instantaneously. But time appears to be real. So 10 years pass, you have a new home, new job. One day you come home, you find your house on fire all of your personal belongings that you love so much have all burnt up. When you take an inventory, you see that there was $50,000 worth of damage. It came back to you, but in a different way. When we understand these things, we stop playing games and we get down to spiritual work. We forget about all these human traits and we begin to realize my true nature is consciousness. I am absolute reality. I am pure awareness, ultimate oneness. This is my real nature. And even if I do not feel it right now, I am going to work on myself continuously. Even if it takes me 10 million lifetimes, I will work on myself diligently and do what has to be done until I become free. The rest is up to you. Now let's chant together Shri Ram J Ram J J Ram. After that talk, I will ask you the question. Does a sage get angry? What do you say? It doesn't get anything. You're on the right track. It depends on who's doing the same. It depends on what you see, where you're coming from. It has nothing to do with the sage. It has to do with where you're coming from. It's like the old Buddhist question. If you see a flag blowing in the breeze, is the breeze moving the flag or is the flag moving the breeze? What's the answer? It's your mind moving. That's it. Exactly. So it is with everything else. If you see a sage becoming angry, it is your mind inventing all this. 
the whole universe is a projection of your mind. So is everything that you see. How about, uh, Robert, a bus is coming down the street. This is, I'm just quoting what I've heard. You step in front of that bus. That Where would you hear it from? I read it. I heard it someplace. I don't know. I'm sure it's classic. Everyone, I'm sure, has heard it. Is the bus real? You know what's going to happen. You step in front of a bus or a car. So what will happen? <laughs> well, reality will wipe you out. Reality physically, will? Physically, the bus will destroy the So you say reality will wipe you out. Well, let but. me ask you. Say you're having a dream. And in that dream, a bus hits you and kills you. Are you wiped out? I'm not talking about the dream. But say you're having a dream. In the dream, yes. In the dream, you'll be wiped out, but you will wake up the next day. So and how about the dream? How about when you wake up from this? Wake up when? From this world. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about physical, actual reality. That's what I'm <laughs> talking about too. <laughs> <laughs> if I came into your world. If I came into your dream, Nate, <laughs> say you're dreaming a bus is about to hit you, and I come into your dream and I say, Nathan, it's a dream. The bus is not really going to kill you. So you will talk to me just like you're doing now. You'll say, Robert, you're crazy. Look, there's the bus. It's about to hit me. I've got to get out of the way before I get killed. Well, I realize. And then you wake up. <laughs> However, I speak in about. You know what I'm speaking about. I don't want to start. Listen, who told you to walk in front of the bus? I'm just saying if you go Mine. across it. No, no. If you're, you step in front of If you're walking across the street and uh, you don't see the bus, or you do see it's too late and it hits you, I'm saying that's what I'm saying. But if you're dreaming, the same situation is taking place. And you're talking just like you are now. I'm not talking about it. But then you wake up. I know what you're saying. There's an actual dream and an actual... Are you but sure what, what, your body is real, just as you're dreaming? Are you in your body? If someone were to hit me, I, I felt that. So were you in the dream. <laughs> if I hit you in the dream, you'd also feel it. And you'd be talking to me exactly like you are now, but then you'll wake up. So, the reason for my talk today is to allow you to wake up and see that this is a dream. So why the question? The question is a denial. What? The question is a denial. But he's waking up. <laughs> That's why they're coming to the road. No, I'm not waking up, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got some water? Be the guest of the universe. Stay asleep as long as you please. <laughs> Look, I feel like making a fool out of myself. No, you're not. Well, you know not to me. Who is the you that's making very, very, very simply, you have the same feeling in what you call it being awake and what you call it being a dream. I you make a distinction you. between them. You call them in the dream, you wake up the next morning. But in a bus, if a bus hits you, if you wake up, you'll be in the hospital. If you wake up. No, you will wake up. You haven't woken up yet. But you will wake up. <laughs> the body gets crushed. It's nothing happens to the stage. What happens is what you believe happens. Whatever you see, that's what happens. To the stage, it's nothing. But you see something. Therefore, whatever you see, that's what you get. Well, the body will get crushed. Sage is not the body, Well, in reality, there's no body to get crushed. Well, there will be that appearance. There appears to be a body. Crushed. To the Ayani. To the Ayani, there's no appearance. There's no appearance, there's no appearance at all. Well, then he's dissolved the world. So it depends where we're coming from. What we see. This is why when some of these sages have been dying from horrible diseases and all of their disciples are screaming and crying, look at you, you're wasting away. And they just laugh. There's no one to waste away. Nobody's there. Could they not have more compassion for their students not to step in the way to the way they're going to have 
They're not interested. The sages realize that's how they learn, by shock. <laughs> I mean, that might be more compassionate. The driving of the See, the realization again is there are no mistakes. It appears a mistake to you, but in reality, there are no mistakes. There is no thing wrong. Then it's not stretching the point, but then it's not a mistake to have stolen. So the pickpockets would have stolen the fifty thousand dollars. If you look at it in relative terms, it's karma for both of them. Um, uh, of course, there's a murderer and a murder. They're both related. So they both have to go through that experience. So the person who was stolen from was just because he was part of the act. Exactly. But when you wake up, you realize there's nobody acting. There's nothing going on. It's all in appearance. Like you're watching a movie. The movie has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then you go home. <laughs> so your life has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then you go home. But if you awaken before the end, you will be awake while in the body, so to speak. And you're always at home? You're always home. <laughs> the psychiatrist can't save you. All the psychiatrist can do is make you normal. <laughs> like everybody else. Normally insane. That's true. Normally. This is why no psychiatrist or psychologist has ever really helped anybody. They seem to help them for a while. But they've got worse problems than they've had before. The problems never stop. Why? Who can tell me? As long as there's an ego, there's a problem. True. You're dealing from the viewpoint of the problem. And you can't solve a problem that way at all. You have to deal from the viewpoint that you are consciousness. And follow the I. And realize I am that I am. And all problems will dissolve. Yeah. Yeah. You can't solve the problem because you think the problem is real. Of course. So never try to solve a problem with a problem. And by with a problem, I mean you're trying to use your mind to solve the problem, and your mind is a problem all along. When the mind becomes quiet, quiescent, still, peaceful, calm, there is no problem. It's only when the mind is active that problems appear to come and go. Well, what do you think? This dream appears a little longer. The truth 
repetitive. <laughs> That's not very beautiful. If he, if Nate gets hit by the bus, uh, he will say. You like to talk about buses? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no. If Nate gets hit by the bus, he'll say, uh, "I'm in pain. I got hit by the bus." Um. But who is it? Who is it that is aware of the pain? Consciousness is aware of the pain. So if consciousness is aware of the pain, consciousness is not the body in them. Well, if Nathan gets hit by a buzz, he has no time to think about all these things. <laughs> He's screaming in pain. So it appears to be very, very real. That's why you have to become realized before you get hit by a bus. <laughs> like when, when Ramana was... <laughs> but there's something, that, there's something that's aware of the incredible pain. The body's in incredible pain, but there's a consciousness that's aware of that. So am I the body who's in incredible pain, or am I the consciousness who's aware of that pain? Consciousness is never aware of pain. Consciousness is aware of itself as absolute reality, as such as Ananda. The pain is aware of its own pain, because the pain is the ego. Oh, the pain is the body mind, then. Of course. So consciousness doesn't even feel. Consciousness. What does consciousness have to do with the world? But it's, a, but it's aware of the body, body mind. Condition. No, it's not. Oh. It couldn't be. Otherwise, it would think like we do. <laughs> Consciousness is free of everything. So it's always transcendental. Always. And, and the whole body mind phenomenon is, is only mind body phenomenon. The body mind phenomenon doesn't exist at all. It appears to exist, and you give it reality because you identify with it. Change your identification and it will disappear. It's not that consciousness is transcendental, that's all there is. That's all there is, right. Why, therefore, why, therefore, would you say avoid a bus? A sage acts spontaneously. A sage doesn't avoid or does avoid. It doesn't make any difference. It just happens. A sage doesn't think about him. If he steps out of the way, steps out of the way. If he gets flattened, he gets flattened. Makes no difference. <laughs> it doesn't matter to the sage. At the moment, it doesn't matter. If you are a sage, there is no moment in which to be different from what you really are. There are real sages. To the sage, nothing is happening. A sage doesn't think like that. To a sage, nothing is happening. Only in your mind you see danger. But a sage has no mind. Why not? Could be yes or no. It makes no difference. See, you're thinking a sage has certain thoughts. But a sage does not think at all. Whatever happens is fine. If it rains, it rains. If it pours, it pours. If it snows, it snows. <laughs> because you're creating a sage in your own image. <laughs> A sage appears to you to do everything a human being does. 
But to the sage, you're doing nothing. Nothing is being done. It appears as if a sage is acting, but there is no action taking place. So it appears key word. It appears can be a key word, yes. Or body identification. Or body identification, yes. Yeah. Uh, Robert, if the sage knows that the bus will destroy people and he sees it coming, he knows the bus probably won't get out of the way, he'll still deliberately walk? No. <laughs> the sage doesn't know anything you said. No, I said he does know that the bus destroys the person. He can't be that unaware. <laughs> the sage is completely empty. <laughs> well, look at it this way. Let's let's change the name of the sage to God. Call the sage a God. Does God get killed by a bus? You're twisting my words around. I'm sorry. I'm no. Serious. Let's intermingle, interchange the terms. Sage and God. They're both synonymous. Can God get killed? Can God go in front of a bus? So a sage has become a god. Therefore, to the human being, the bus appears to have flattened the sage, and the sage has become a pancake. But to the sage, none of this is happening. Let me ask you a question. Would you, if you saw a bus coming, wouldn't your instinct move you out of the way of the bus, although you are where you're coming from? I've got nothing to do with that. I would just do what has to be done. That's what I'm saying. Your instinct would, like you saw, uh, uh, you start walking to see an abyss, <laughs> you wouldn't walk into the abyss. Well, of course not. But it isn't instinct. It's just common sense. That's what I'm saying. That's what I said from originally. That the bus is coming in. I wasn't speaking about a sage at the time. I was speaking about anyone. Oh, well, you're calling a sage anyone. Hmm? We're referring to sages. I say it's just common sense or instinct. What anyone does not to walk in front of the bus. Well, a human being, of course. A human being has a choice to do whatever they like. The sage is a human being in that sense. To you. Physically, he's a human being. That's how you see it. I'll go back again to the sky is blue. When the sky is blue, you say it looks beautiful. But in reality, there is no sky and there is no blue. It's an optical illusion. But when you look from here, you say, here's a beautiful blue sky. Or when you're in the desert and you want to drink of water, you see a mirage. You see an oasis. It doesn't exist, but you think it's real. In the same way, that's how I say it sees the world, as an optical illusion. But he knows it's an optical illusion, and you don't. So it's sort of like being in Disneyland, where like this is one one event we're in right now, and if you know it's Disneyland, you just enjoy it. If you get hit by a bus, that's just another ride uh, uh, <laughs> that you don't get really too concerned about. If it happens to happen, that's just another uh, attraction. Well, you can say that if you like. But to a sage, there's no coming and no going, and nothing is ever happening. I, I, I'm pursuing it. If someone told the sage that the bus could destroy his physical body, and he saw this bus coming, would he still persist? And Why would he persist? <coughs> he wouldn't then, because someone told him <coughs> excuse me, that the bus could destroy his physical body. Well, why would he want to kill his physical body? I'm saying he, he you said he's an illusion. I said yeah. if someone told him the bus was an illusion, but if they told him the bus could actually destroy him, then he wouldn't, from what the knowledge he has, he wouldn't walk in front of the bus. You're saying he would. No, I'm not saying he would. I said it makes no difference. It doesn't make any difference. Even if he knew what would happen, it still would make no difference? It would make no difference. Maybe what what 
That's the answer. The stage of sounds. Do you see what the stage is now? Space. Emptiness. No thing. If you define what the stage is, it's not that. Our values, basically, I would say most of the people in this room have the value that it's better to be healthy than to be sick. And in watching people that we know become ill and die, um, I suppose we try to find out why this happens to people who um, appear To be, it seemed to appear to me that down deep inside, in their real consciousness, they had either um, a mindset of rage or hopelessness or feeling that life was not worthwhile. Is this causing effect? Is there any? Is there any reason to think about that? You are speaking in relative terms, and that's part of the relative world. So if you're identifying with the relative world, you've got to do everything you have to do to take care of your body, your health, and everything else. But that's in the relative world. But is that not wise for us, really? Of course. As long as you think you are the body and your mind, and you have to do everything you can to take care of yourself. So you each try to exercise to take care of yourself. But once you understand who you are, everything changes. But is it not so that people who <clears throat> could one even say make themselves sick? Well, of course. In the relative world, you can do anything. You can make yourself sick, you can make yourself well, you can kill yourself, you can make yourself the healthiest person on earth. Whatever you like to do, you do. It's all part of It's all part of the game. It's all cause and effect. But you have nothing to do with that. Your real self is beyond that. Your real self is beyond time and space. But even the understanding of that would affect us on the... On the what are we calling this? The relative world. On the relative world. Well, first understand that and then ask me. If it's so. I'm sorry, I lost the thought. First I'm scared. That you're not real. Yeah. I believe that. Well, that's not good enough. Is another step. When you understand your true reality, there will be no question like that. The question is only for the Ayani or the person who does not understand. There are two words. 
Yanni and Eight Yanni? <laughs> <laughs> there are two Yannis. Is it Anne Yanni or? No. Anne Yanni is the opposite of Yanni. Yanni means wisdom, uh-huh. infinite wisdom. So Yanni is ignorance. Let's listen to some more music. Feel free to continue asking questions. Whatever is on your mind. I just saw in the few days newspaper it's a short poetry. Of course. Uh, American man. Would you like to read that? Thank you. In today's newspaper? In today's newspaper. Where can we possibly find today's newspaper? <laughs> this is called Petition for Nuclear Creed by Mary Tall Mountain. In the brief interface, of the moment's light, dangling time like the poise of a dancer's heel, before the final pirouette across the galaxy, we search the impervious planet for familiar signals. We probe the stars with silver shafts for some new land bridge, but stars are veiled and silent. Unseen watchers who perceive the devil's dance of nations the great lethal video game. May know it comes tomorrow, that last astounding flash in the dust. We will not have time to go the path of Atahula Lapa, emperor of the Inca. He shall leave no seals like his to mark our fleeting presence, only the feathers of our fiery selves sunken to ashes, blown on implacable wind. From the light on the tenth wall, American Indian Study Center. Thank you. We have enough trouble with such as the nine, and now we have to know how to hoop our. <laughs> that was nice, buddy. <laughs> When I, I wrote the, the poetry, I was uh, reading a book, an uh, astronomy book, about the high temperatures of the star. So, uh, something we can even imagine to measure. And such amount of power uh, really shaped me thinking about the power of the universe, mm-hmm. what we really are. Yes. And our pretension to understand <coughs> anything around us sounds like a, we really didn't have any chance to do that, right? Of course, when you understand that the whole universe is an emanation of your own mind, then you will realize that you are the power. There is no power outside of you. You are that. And your whole perspective changes. This is why it's so important to find our own reality. Because we're always giving something outside of ourselves credit as being a mighty power, a mighty force, something having control over our souls. But this is not true. The self is consciousness, and you are that. And there is no other power besides you. Of course. This is this is something I just want you to read first. Oh, this is in English. Okay. <laughs> The 
which is called illusion. God and I in space alone, and nobody else in view. And where are the people, O Lord, I said, the earth below and the sky overhead, and the dead whom I once knew? That was a dream, God smiled and said, a dream that seemed to be true. There were no people, living or dead. There was no earth and no sky overhead. There was only myself and you. Why do I feel no fear, I asked, meeting you here in this way? For I have sinned, I know full well. And there is heaven and there is hell. And is this the judgment day? Nay, those were dreams, the great God said. Dreams that have ceased to be. There are no such things as fear or sin. There is no you. You have never been. There is nothing at all but me. <laughs> Beautiful. Who wrote that? Called, I was just giving it to Robert to see if he'd like to have it here. Oh, Robert, yeah, we're we'll just having it. <laughs> it's, um, by, it's called Illusion by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Oh. Isn't that beautiful? I had it sent to you. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it's right on. I know, and I just oh, oh, when I read it. <laughs> Sounds just like Robert. I know it is. Oh, here, can I read one other thing? Sure. sure. Keep going. <laughs> no, these I had Xerox off. These are, these are beautiful, too. This is called The Rules for Being Human. Did you make enough for everybody? Uh, I, yes, I made 25 copies of those. I didn't make the others because I didn't know if Robert wanted that. Too, but I made 25 copies for these. It said, the first is, you will receive a body. You may like it or hate it but it will be yours for the entire period this time around. Number two, you will learn lessons. You are enrolled in a full-time informal school called life. Each day in this school, you will have the opportunity to learn lessons. You may like the lessons or think them irrelevant and stupid. And three, there are no mistakes, only lessons. Growth is a process of trial and error, of experimentation. The failed experiments are as much a part of the process as the experiment that ultimately works. And four, a lesson is repeated until learned. A lesson will be presented to you in various forms until you have learned it. And when you have learned it, you can then go on to the next lesson. And five, learning lessons does not end. There is no part of life that does not contain its lessons. If you are alive, there are lessons to be learned. And six, there is no better than here. When your there has become a here, you will simply obtain another there that will again look better than here. And seven, others are merely mirrors of you. You cannot love or hate something about another person unless it reflects to you something you love or hate about yourself. Eight, when you make of your, what you make of your life is up to you. You have all the tools and resources you need. What you do with them is up to you. The choice is yours. Nine, your answers lie inside you. The answers to life's questions lie inside you. All you need to do is look, listen, and trust. And number ten, you will forget all this. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Could you tell me that number to buy it? I'm going to have to A learning lesson does not end. There's no part of life that does not contain its lessons. If you are alive, there are lessons to be learned. That's on a relative plan. Very much so.
Well, has the nani learned all the lessons and, and he has no more lessons? No, there never was any lessons. By definition. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we can avoid a lot, like a poetry at this point, we can avoid the kind of the fear uh, of all those things happen, um, because every time something like this, uh, I read something like this, or like what happened right now in the world, you don't see nothing but war, violence, and things like that. I want to, or I don't, I feel like I'm responsible for that, and at least you cannot do one thing, but what can I do? So, like when I was reading the astronomy book, for one hand, was really interesting, but for another Because when you become self-realized, you become omnipresent. Your self is the self of the universe. There are not two selves or three selves. There is one self. And when you realize your true self, you realize the whole universe as your true self. Your true self is harmony and bliss. Your true self is absolute reality. When you can see that in yourself, you will see that in everyone else. And you will see a different world. One of love and peace. So find yourself and your feelings will change accordingly. Do you follow that? You are responsible for what you see. If you're seeing something you don't like, the way to change it is not by changing the condition. As an example, let's say we stop the war in Iraq and there's a peaceful settlement. Three years from now, there will be another conflict somewhere else. And we'll have the same condition. And if we stop that, a couple of years later, it'll be something else. It never stops. You cannot change the condition. <coughs> change yourself, and the condition will change. I understand what you're saying. No. If you can't find yourself and understand the truth about yourself, then you have to love and hate. That's natural. You can't tell a person to stop, stop hating Hitler and to love Hitler. They can't do it. It's impossible. What if, what Don't try. No, you can't. You're just putting it on. The only thing you can do is to change yourself. When you, well, tell me that when you change yourself. When you lift yourself higher, you see a whole new universe. Everything becomes brand new. And everything is different. So you have to work on yourself and make the according, accordingly make the changes within yourself. It's like the question that Pedro asked. Do not try to love or hate anyone. Work on yourself. Transcend the world. And then see what you feel. Yes. Yes. When you say when you say the world, you also mean the whole universe, the, the stars. The yes, because everything is a projection of your mind. So by changing your mind, 
You're changing the universe. I know it sounds strange, but it's true. We don't look at it that way. You work on yourself. And Hitler becomes a part of yourself. And you see a whole new perspective. What you cannot see now. Now you have to change people. Why? Because, well, I understand my position in this country because, because I was fearful that, that she would hurt me. But now I, 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 I love her, I adore her, I wish I could see her again. I completely understand her position in what made her act that way. So I see that my feelings of fear uh, and rage must be the same kind of feeling. But he's dead. Well, I'm saying for that kind of feeling, for any kind of feeling, for me to say that you weren't going to hurt me. That's very commendable. But if that person raped you or hurt you, you wouldn't think the same thing, would you? My mother hurt me, and I see the same. Now you do. But before you didn't. But now I have a perspective of being so tender, so I can forgive that to everyone. Is your mother dead? That's why you love her. But if she were alive, would you love her if she were alive? If she were alive, you probably wouldn't love her. It's easy to love somebody when they're dead. (laughs) But forget about all that. See yourself in reality. Go deep within yourself and expand your consciousness and become free. Is this, is this not like a card game of self-compassion? Is that not like working on yourself? Is to is to really working on yourself. Working on yourself is commendable, but that's the hard way to try to change your emotions. Rather, see who has the emotions. Find out who has them and get rid of the eye that has the emotions and then you'll be free. No, no. (laughs) Bye. He just did it. He just did it all. (laughs) I thought you were going to shoot me. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's practice. We call this meditation and we're going to do something with ourselves to see what happens. Make yourself comfortable. You can close your eyes to remove obstructions. Focus your attention on your breath. Become the witness to your breath. When your mind starts thinking, gently go back to your breath and focus all of your energy on your breath, on your respiration.
you are witnessing your breath. Ask yourself the question, who is the witness? Who is witnessing the breath? The answer comes, I am. With your respiration, when you inhale, say I to yourself. When you exhale, say I am. I am. If your mind wanders, gently bring it back. I am is the first name of God. It is you. I am that I am. It is consciousness. It is your soul. By repeating this with your respiration, you become it. Gently go back to I am. Gradually, the space in between I and am will widen. Any further questions, comments, criticisms, answers?